Kyle here from allmediareviews.blogspot.com. Today's topic is the band Fair to Midland. Band based out of Texas. I should know the actual part of Texas. It's not Dallas or Fort Worth and it's not Houston. It's... Oh, I can't remember. I should know. It's been a long time, but um, they were a band that I kind of got... I felt like almost like I, I, I became part of like an extended family of, in a way. Um, came out in the, well, they, I found out about them in the mid-2000s, sort of late, mid to late 2000s, but, um, well, you know, let's just kind of go at it here. Their first album, Carbon Copy Silver Lining, uh, came out, I don't know, I don't have a copy of it, it went out of print, and then they reprinted it, and it got to be really rare, then it was being sold regularly on eBay for a lot of money, but stylistically, it, they were very, very much of like, I don't even call it post-hardcore, but it was sort of in that vein. They were influenced by metal and hard rock, but, uh, you know, the vocal style was definitely kind of all over the place and not very understandable. Um, and I've listened to it, I don't know, four or five times, maybe. Um, and I like little bits of it, but, you know, it's, I wouldn't call it incoherent, but, you know, the guys formed in Texas, uh, well, some of the guys at least, Cliff the Campbell, the guitar player, and Andrew Darrow Suttereth, the singer, um, and the drummer Brett, and I'm, I'm John Dickin, the bass player. I'm pretty sure it was those four. Uh, anyway, so that, I don't know, that was the local CD. But so the first album that they put out that a lot of people caught on after that point was called um, Interfunda Stifle, um, which was in 2004. Oops, my bad. You can see I have all the signatures, and um, so it was post their their first album, Carbon Copy Silver Line, was post hardcore. This album is definitely more in the progressive rock vein. Um, it's it's a really good record. The production values initially I didn't have any like I didn't even it didn't bother me one bit. I mean I come to learn that the production values was sort of a product of the of the budget they probably had but um it had a lot of their classic tunes and then some songs that didn't end up on another record after this or a couple records after this but i mean actually this is somewhat of a concept i guess oh geez my cd's falling out i know this actually went out of print at 1.2 and then they reissued it and they were selling it at shows and the shows i'll be talking about as well as a big part of why i'm talking about this band today um the one thing about them is that you, see, you can see lyrics on here, but they were pretty, um, oh, geez. They were pretty, um, pretty, I uh, the word stubborn's not it, but definitely of the interest just to limit the lyrics and let the listeners and the fans sort of figure the lyrics out for themselves, even though a lot of the lyrics, I would almost compare to Yes or some other bands where their lyrics, they do have a story or a kind of a, uh, a theme of sorts, but a lot of them are used how they sound when Darrow or Andrew sing, sings them as opposed to, um, but I mean, my favorites on this, the, the, ver the first version of Dance of the Manatee, Vice Versa, A Seafarer's Not, Orphan Anthem 86, I love that track. Um, they, have, they use like these synths or um, ivory keys, they talk about ivory in, in the lyrics. Um, Walls of Jericho, um, Upgrade Brigade, and Kylie Cries Cologne. But the other thing about this record, so a lot of those songs were shown up again at a later point, but a couple of the tracks that did not, that they never really played live either. Granny Niblo and, what's the other one? Um, Timbuktu. And even Abigail. Yeah, those three actually, but, oh, the, the, I mean... They're, they're, they were a heavy rock band. I mean, I, I found out about them through the Dredge fans, really. I didn't even mention that. Being a huge Dredge fan in the mid-2000s, a lot of the Dredge fans were fans of them. Um, but, so, you know, this is Interfund to Stifle, and a lot of people consider this actually to be their favorite record. But let's just kind of go on to the sake of time. So that was in 2004. Then they put out this EP. I think this is right when they got signed to Serge Tankian's label of System of a Down, and I, Surgical Strike, the EP called um, the Quarter, Drawn and Quarter EP, which is um, 
this is about the time this came out not long um, before I actually got into them. It was like toward the end of 2006. I remember because I went down to like Arizona for uh, Thanksgiving, I think it was, and I went to Zia Records and I saw their CDs there and I just heard about them. But um, so on this EP, they they included two original demos. The the production values compared to Indifferent to Stifle was a step up. Um, again, they're just giving you some of the lyrics. They, they <laughs> I know Andrew was very uh, much, you know, someone who wanted to keep some mystery with the fans. He got, the, got them to sign it. So I hadn't seen them live at this point, though, and I was still just start, starting to discover my, my fandom. And I was like, oh, this band's pretty good, Fair to Midland. Um, but, um, yeah, it has the Orphan Anthem 86 demo, which... I'd probably go to that one over, over the one on Indifferent to Stifle more. Kyla Cries Cologne demo, Seafire is Not Live, and Abigail Live. And then it has a video which talks about the history of the band and everything like that. So, I mean, they, this is 2006. They'd already been a band for, like, almost, nah, not 10 years, but, like, seven. They formed, like, in 99 or 2000, toward the end of, of the century or the early part of the century. So, but they that was on Surge Tank. This is on Surge Tank and Surgical Strike label. So it was a, some of the system of down was a big deal back in 2005, 2006, 2007. So, so then they put out there's kind of trademark record to me, Fables from a Mayfly. What I tell you th three times is true. Is it? Yeah, yeah. And so a lot of the songs from Interfunda Stifle um, ended up on this record, like Mew and like Kevin Gilbert and like Three, the band Three. They ended up re-recording a lot of these, and they had uh, David Bottrill of Tool and Peter Gabriel and King Crimson and I'm Mother Earth and Dream Theater and uh, not ours. But who's the other person he's worked? He's worked with a few of people that I've recently that I really love. So the it's almost like it was like hearing the songs for um, the first time again or a new version. I got my signatures, and I saw them in February of 2007 before this album came out, and then I saw them two or three more times. They're from Texas, so they. They ended up catching on with the DJ, and they did a video for Dance of the Manatee. Dance of the Manatee became their biggest track. Uh, got some radio play, including on 93X here, locally in Minnesota. Um, and they just found it to be convenient to be booked for shows here regularly. They played the Varsity Theater, they played uh, Station 4, they played the Rock Night Club. Um, they never played First Avenue, nor the, the, the entry, which was ridiculous, but... Um, so you have Dance of the Mantry, Kyla Cries Cologne, Vice Versa. Vice Versa in some ways is their most proggy track. The vocal harmonies are the segues of kind of soft, quiet, soft, quiet. and um, <sighs> Walls of Jericho, that should have been another, that was a single, I think. And that was catchy. I almost thought that was almost a more marketable track than even Dance of the Mantry. Dance of the Mantry, got, they got more well-known for, but that's an earworm track. Um, Say One was a new track. A few of these songs were new. The Wolf Descends Upon the Spanish Sahara, The Wife, the Kids, and the White Picket Fence, April Fools, and Eggman. But Seafarer's Knot was from Interfund to Stifle. So it was sort of a cross. Tall Tales, Taste Like Sour Grapes. It was, it, tales, you know, or Tales? Yeah, Fables, rather. Very much of a product of where they're from in Texas, I think. Sort of, uh, sort of rural parts, I would guess. You know, very much of, like, old kind of storybook of, like, giants and, you know... Um, you know, Jack and the Beanstalk, uh, look at the, uh, Genesis, I know Darrow or a Andrews very, was a fan of Genesis, probably the Peter Gabriel Genesis, and some of this reminded me of the artwork from that. Um, so and I, I ended up getting also the Dance of the Manatee single EP, it was really like a sampler EP, which I think is a center radio, which has those four songs, Tall Tale, Tastes Like Sour Grapes, Walls of Jericho, and April Fool's, Eggman, um, I don't know if I, I bought this at the show or someone gave it to me. I can't remember. But I saw them three or four times in 2007. And then from 2007 to 2011, I probably saw them maybe a dozen times. So I saw them regularly. They got to know me. <laughs> they were giving me stickers to hand out and everything. I did buy the vinyl for Fables from a Mayfly also, which I can show. This is actually one of the first records I ever bought. I'm not even sure, but I think I bought this record gatefold. Um... I think I bought this record uh, at, um, I mean, before I even met my wife. I can't remember when this came out on vinyl, but, you know. I started buying a lot of vinyl when I met my wife in 2011. But, um, yeah, so this was this was a big deal. And, you know, in 2007, this album came out, and, you know, there were so many good records in 2007. 
but it was right in there. I was addicted to this album, just like I was addicted to Set Sail the Prayer from Caddis Fly, The Deer Hunters Act 2, um, Ocean Size uh, Frames, which came out a little bit later, because this came out like in April. But um, say when that the closer is an epic kind of vocal track a lot of people think of, but I will say I know they got a little bit of criticism by some of the prog folks when people were telling them, because it was progressive rock of a sort, for not... Um, haven't many, if any, guitar solos, but, you know, I don't really need a guitar solo, you know? The music's good, the melodies are good, the chorus are good, it's memorable, whatever. So, um, so, and then there were some issues that came up with them, unfortunately. They toured a lot, but trying to release their next record, it took a long time. Um, they did come out with Arrows and Anchors, finally, in 2011, the, the follow-up to Fables from a Mayfly. And this has a lot of good music on it. Here's the Arrows and Anchors CD. I didn't buy the vinyl for a couple of reasons. I know there were some issues actually with it. I know people that did buy it, but um, uh, it just I don't. The the biggest thing is there's some, some really good songs on this album. I loved hearing them live. I would say Musical Chairs, Loophole and Limbo. Uh, Ricky Ticky Tabby, that's a crazy vocal track, you know, because the vocalist, Andrew, has these weird styles where he goes clean and then growls, but he's not doing death metal vocals. He kind of has a very, very wide spectrum of singing, a very unique style of singing, but he has very good falsetto range. So um, Ricky Ticky Tabby may be his most out there vocal performance from like when I think of Fair to Midland's um, catalog and songs. Copper Tank Island's another one. A lot of good, cool guitar tones on this record. Um, it varies, there's more folk elements on it, but I'll just say not to, to beat a dead horse or make too much of an issue. The reason why I've never grown too attached to this record is because the production. It was produced by Joe Baresti, I believe, and mixed, and the cymbals clipped a lot on a lot of it, and so, um, I didn't listen to it, like, excessively. I love the live versions more, um, but it's hard for me to listen to when you have compressed cymbals and it just sounds like a, uh, high pitched tone tambourine constantly. Um, they're not, it's not the only case. Joe Baresi, or whatever his name is, has had other records. There's a Coheed and Cambria record that sounds similar to that, the Mars Volta ever record, but, you know, so it's sort of a loudness wars uh, product to an extent, so I know a lot of people love this record, think it's better than Fables, you know, but um, the Fables versus Fables, you know, the, the comp you know, c comparisons. I love Fables. I think this should be synced up with the movie Big Fish. <laughs> I told Darrow about that once. And he said, yeah, you should try that. But um, anyway, I've also got a couple of live, like this is, this is one live at Andy's Bar. And I, I'd say, because I saw them a dozen times or whatever, this is a DVD, that they were probably as good, if not better, of a live band than they were a studio band. Even though Fables from a Mayfly, the, the production is really good and you know, the songs are great. I, I would never argue that. The songs are very good on, on, on all their albums, actually, other than maybe the first record. I don't know if I would <laughs> say that much about the songs, but because um, I can't even tell you off the top of my head any of the songs from it. That's how often I listen to it. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, Darrow's, like, singing from the... He, like, hang himself from the ceiling and go upside down and start doing, like, uh, vocals that way, playing to the crowd and... They didn't ever play the songs, like, identical. They do, like, little sound bites and sound clips. And um, th th every show I saw, all, like, 10, 11, like, 12 or whatever it was, that were memorable and in some ways different. Um, and I have this one. This is also from the, the, the Arrows and Anchors period or before. A lot of these songs were played live. Um, it's called The Machine Shop. I think this is just a live CD. And I think I, I listened to this a couple times, but um, it's... But I was really in a fair to Midland kick, and I would, you know, I'd go see them live. I'd be listening to some of them, their music. But you look at the set list. Uh oh, Dance of the Manatee, Musical Chairs, Risky and Ridlin. And then, of course, I have Welcome to the Dirt, the DVD, um, which has the recording sessions for Arrows and Anchors. I mean, they spent a lot of time making Arrows and Anchors. I feel so bad about that. How how much I haven't been able to appreciate it because it took forever. It was four years, and they were just constantly touring. They were working so hard. And fortunately, that kind of ended their run. Um, right now, they're kind of indefinite hiatus, uh, as far as I know. They didn't do, really talk a lot, but I know Cliff Campbell's in another band. I know Darrow was talking about doing a solo album at one point. I don't know if it ever happened. There's a lot of passionate fans on Facebook, on a Facebook group. There was a message board that got revived, was around, and came, went down, went, got revived. But if they never do anything else, they have this, especially to me, as their legacy. This is just a, 
one of my favorite records of the the twenty two thousands and really and I don't know it got a, I probably listened to this album like two hundred times it's just, you know um, it's just very great energy great hooks great vocal performances great guitar lines great keyboards that's one thing that stands out they actually have Matt Langley joined them. At, I think it was for Indefund to Stifle, and they had a full-time keyboard player. And he also played keyboards like Jordan Rudis, and like the guy from uh, Tony McAlpine with Planet X was like, or I think of Derek Sherinian, uh, Planet X, where it was like inverted. I always remember that. I don't know if he always did that, but I think mo a lot of the shows we I saw Matt Langley, he did, he had that keyboard set up where he was, the keyboard was like inverted, and it was just like easier for him to play that way. But yeah, they were just uh, an amazing live band, some of my favorite concerts ever. I'll have to tell some more stories about some of the shows that I saw with them, but um, I love them. I feel like I'm still sort of part of extended family. They know me as the, the Kyle dude from Minnesota um, and uh, Cliff Campbell specifically. I really just great guy, great musician, great songwriter, you know, and um, maybe they'll come back someday. That's the hope. Some of the fans, the Harker fans think someday maybe they will return. So, but, um, but thank you for watching. Uh, do you know Fair to Midland? Have you ever heard them? If, if you like Tool, a lot, they've been compared to Tool, Tool or the Mars Volta, you know, they, I don't know who else to compare them to, or Dredge, of course. If you're into that kind of a alternative progressive rock uh, of the 2000s especially, uh, heavier especially, uh, Fair to Midland definitely is worth checking out even though they're not currently active. If you like Carnival, who's another band who uh, I'll have to talk about in a later video, they actually toured with them. Uh, they toured with a lot of bands I like. Carnival's another band if you like you should definitely check out, or Richelieu is another one. There's a whole long list of bands. I consider Fair to Midland sort of the best or the kings of that kind of heavy alternative art rock or whatever you want to call it of the 2000s. So, again, thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing if you've recently subscribed. If you're not, please subscribe, and I'll see you next time.